everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this workshop on tribology wear and damage mechanisms. Um, so let's uh, let's just kick off by uh, finding out where you're from. Uh, so uh, if you could say hello and where you're joining from in the chat, that would be fantastic. Uh, okay, let me just bring up my slides for a moment. Okay, so no responses just yet. Um, Okay, just want to make sure you're all loaded in just fine. Hello, excellent. So we're getting, uh, oh, fantastic. People from all over the place, Germany, Sweden, India, France. Oh, fantastic. So I, I hope you're all doing well and everything's, everything is, uh, everything's okay or as best it can be uh, where you're joining from. Okay, all right. Well, from Leeds, oh, fantastic stuff. So. But um, so, as I said, this will be wear and damage mechanisms. So this will cover a, um, a little bit of the sort of fundamentals of tribology. So a little bit of history, um, some background on uh, laws of dry friction, uh, laws, of, laws of wear, excuse me, a little bit about uh, lubrication, and then talking about um, the various or main types of wear mechanisms in tribology, and a little bit about how the instrumentation and the measurement of tribological tests. Um, and we'll have a Q and A session. So what we'll try and do is I will go through uh, my section of the uh, of the workshop. Uh, we'll have a quick Q and A. I'll try and pick up. Um, I'll try and pick up. Uh, questions um, as I go. So when I actually get going, please go ahead and type your questions into the chat. I'll try and uh, either answer those as, our, as I'm going, or if it's a more complex question, I'll mark it as a question. We'll cover it in the Q&A, do a quick Q&A once I'm finished, then um, just talk about some of our upcoming events. And then I will um, we'll introduce uh, Nishil from Anton Parr, who will be talking uh, through uh, the tribometer and uh, AFM demo. Uh, so presentation copy or yes, so there will be a copy. So there is a there will be an email that will go out um, with a, a replay of this webinar and it will also be available on the Surface Ventures website. Uh, so now I think would be a good time to, uh, so might be one to, to just have open in another tab. Uh, so you can check it out later, but here is the, uh, so the Surface Ventures website. Please go ahead and uh, do click on that. And before we uh, before we properly get started, I'd uh, great to see where you're all coming from. But I'd like to a little bit more information about um, what stage you're at in your career. Are you an undergraduate or master's student, PhD student, tenured academic, post? Oh, fantastic! Thank you all. So a uh, poll question there. Okay, so a lot of a lot of PhD students, fantastic stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. So let's begin before getting diving into you know too many details. Let's talk about what tribology is. So essentially, the science and technology of interacting surfaces in relative motion, and related subjects and practices, which is a fine definition, but. What does that mean instead of getting caught up in the jargon of, um, you know, what various complex words mean? It's essentially friction, wear, and lubrication in the study of, of that. So any surfaces in motion and the friction, wear, and lubrication of those surfaces. So this uh, comes from tribos, the Greek word meaning rubbing or sliding, and ology, which is essentially the study of. And this uh, subject, as I'm sure you're all very aware, uh, covers a vast array of areas from, you know, we have our, our little diagram here from extremely small MEMS devices to space, rail interfaces, um, pistons and cars. Um, this is a truly universal subject. Uh, a little bit of history. Uh, so we have the, the formalization of the field was only in 1966. So at least formally a relatively young subject. Uh, so this is with the JUST report. So a report, um, a government uh, report headed by Professor Peter JUST, um, essentially to investigate the then current state of lubrication, education, and research. Um, so this, um, the study of 
friction wear lubrication was, of course, being carried out throughout the UK um, at that point. Uh, but this was to investigate how um, what work needs to be done to improve this. Um, part of the uh, part of the findings for this report was how much. Um, energy and of course financial savings could be made by optimizing the tribology as it then became known of um, various things throughout the UK and um, one of the recommendations also was uh, the founding of several schools uh, doctoral training centers things like that which over the various years uh, has been done um, so there's far more uh, tribology education and of course research in the UK then uh, possibly there there ever was, but going back even uh, even further than 1966, some of the earliest um, evidence of tribological knowledge uh, was identified by um, the late Professor Duncan Dowson, um, who in his book History of Tribology um, found this fantastic um, fantastic uh, carving of um, several men, I believe. I think if you count them all, I think it's probably about 100, 180 on of them, pulling this large statue. And what you see right at the, just on the foot of the statue might be the earliest uh, tribologist. So this man is, is pouring what looks like water, possibly, onto the sand. So to reduce the friction of pulling this statue. So we have our, our very early tribologist there. Um, so before I go on, I'd just like to just have another poll question. So now a little bit about what tribology is. So I just curious to know if, um, if you are all using tribology or if you're just as PhD as primarily PhD students here, uh, using it. Okay. Excellent. So all mostly tribology, uh, researchers okay so going on with a little bit more history right now so i have uh, some other work by leonardo da vinci so we have um uh these pictures here um very similar to the sort of thing that you might have done for uh early um study of mechanics in in school <clears throat> and this was very much the, the work that leonardo da vinci was doing looking at the uh coefficient of friction of sliding blocks on surfaces uh, we have other work by uh, by Robert Hooke looking at the friction and wear reduction in bearings, 1684. Amontant, who um, started um, essentially started the ball rolling, if you excuse the pun, on the actual laws um, of friction and the role of asperities, essentially the you know the point contacts of um, uh, between surfaces. Uh, Coulomb, who investigated static and kinetic friction and essentially established the third law of friction. So we'll cover these um, a little later. Isaac Babbitt, um, who looked at low friction metals in the 1800s. And then somewhat more recently, Bowden and Tabor, who looked at asperity deformation and the adhesion theory of friction. And there are many more beyond these. You could dedicate a whole lecture um, just onto, um, uh, just looking at the you know, history of tribology. There's of course been books on it, as I said, before. So moving on, let's look at friction itself before we move on to the other other elements of tribology. So essentially, this is a resistance to motion as one surface moves over another. And we uh, we have three laws of dry friction. Uh, the first of which is that frictional force is directly proportional to the applied load. And this um, essentially results in what we get our coefficient of friction. So between two surfaces for our friction is proportional to an applied load, and this is specific to the two surfaces and can be specific to the environment um, that these surfaces are in. So, but generally under, under relatively normal conditions, you will have the same coefficient of friction for two surfaces sliding over each other. And again, you can, you can find tables of these for, you know, for different material pairings, um, but this can change. So it's not an intrinsic property of the materials at all. Going on to the other two uh, friction uh, laws, friction is independent of the apparent contact area. We'll come on to that a little bit later, talking about real contact area. Uh, hello to those just joining us now in the uh, in the chat. Good to uh, good to have you there. Um, and then the final uh, law of dry friction 
is that frictional force is independent from sliding velocity. Okay, so generally within a, a reasonably normal range, once again, of sliding velocities, you won't get uh, a change in the friction force, but so. And then with this diagram here, we can essentially think of this as asperities sliding up and over each other. So between two surfaces, and that's what gets, that's what generates our, our frictional force on a very fundamental level. So we have a stick slip, as I said before. So you can think of this as there's essentially two things. So the static coefficient of friction. So the friction, the coefficient of friction in terms of force required to initiate motion. And then the actual kinetic coefficient of friction. So the amount of, of friction required to be overcome to maintain motion. Okay, so this is uh, this is very important in sort of start stop systems, and also for things where you get you get squeaking. Like the six slip is a, a really good example. Is um, when your rubber shoes squeak. There's a good example of stick slip when you move them along the floor. That's what that's what causes that. So move on to some other things here. We have flash temperature. So naturally, you know, any two surfaces rubbing together will heat up. So this is uh, at the actual uh, over prolonged periods in a contact, you will increase the temperature, but um, the actual generation of this temperature heating is very much at asperity, asperity contact. So this is a very sharp localized temperature rise. So this was initially this sort of flash temperature, an idea of flash temperature was, in, um, was initiated by Bloch. So if you look up uh, Bloch flash temperature, if you want to do some more reading into this, um, so this, these, this, temperature at the asperities is much higher than the average surface temperature. Uh, so this is just due to um, due to the actual, this is, you know, the rubbing of asperities over each other. Um, useful for calculating breaking temperatures um, or looking at uh, frictional welding is one. So you can look at, uh, you know, if you do want to do, you know, essentially rubbing two surfaces together in order to, um, in order to fuse them. But then also this, uh, this isn't just there for um, fusing materials or breaking. An increase in temperature um, could change, you know, localized phases at surfaces, could generate energy for tribochemical reactions, very important for some of the lubrication things we're going to talk about a little later. So real contact area. So this is a, it's a fascinating thing. So on the macro scale, we may, we probably expect the contact area to be 100% of the actual apparent contact area, which, you know, of course, when we think about asperities and the actual structure of surfaces, you know, the fact they are, um, they are uh, fractally rough, depending on how far you zoom in. Um, surface contact is in fact only made on the surface of the asperities. And this is where wear begins. So once, once you, um, if your contact pressure exceeds your your yield pressure, then you're going to begin to uh, wear your surfaces. So I like to do a, have a little bit of a, a sort of interactive bit now. So what do you think the real contact area is for surfaces? Um, you know, two sort of average surfaces without extremes of of surface roughness or anything. Let's have some uh, let's have some 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 guesses in the uh, in the chat. What do you all think? Anything? Five percent? Okay. It's an interesting guess. Ten percent? Okay. So a few more. Okay. Twenty. Interesting. One percent depends. Indeed, it does depend. Yeah, it does. De it does depend on the load. Um, of course, we can sort of think of. You know, depending on the formulation of, of contact manic mechanics that you use, um, you know, depends if you're looking at deformable asperities. Um, but typically, we'd sort of say that this is, in fact, you know, it's fascinating that we we all assume that it's that it's going to be um, that it's going to be quite large, like the five, ten, twenty percent. But it's in fact typically less than one percent. Yeah, Hertzian contact mechanics is typical when you're looking at non-deformable surfaces. But yeah. It's, normally less than 1% of the apparent contact area. Um, you know, it can be as low as, you know, like 0 0.001 or perhaps even lower depending on your, your surface, but yeah, our actual asperity contact. 
less than one percent. So thank you very much for that little bit of a uh, little bit of interaction there, guys. Let's move on. So, and one of these things with this um, real contact area is that for macro scale tribology, um, this doesn't quite give us the full picture of what's happening between the asperity context. It's very difficult to to study fundamentals at the at the macro scale between large uh, sliding contacts. Um, it's great for studying, you know, wear rate of, of actual components and things, which we'll come on to a little bit uh, later when talking about uh, measuring tribological tests. Um, but to really get to that, to get to those fundamentals, we need to we need to bring the scale down. We need to we need to decrease uh, the size of our contacts, move to uh, move to much smaller asperities, typical sort of uh, spherical or spheroconical asperities as used in, in nano tribological tests. Uh, so that's where we have an extremely high contact pressure. And essentially we can look at that as a single asperity contact, which allows us to really look at uh, the fundamentals. This is, this is very good for uh, nanotribological sliding tests, for scratch testing. Um, and you can even do you know, even smaller tests for, you know, for say impact testing, which we'll come on to a little bit later. Um, so that's, that's how we get to, to fundamentals in this and now moving on to where so essentially this is progressive damage um, as two surfaces uh, come into contact typically we look at this as uh, motion over another sliding over another but there are as I said before multiple wear mechanisms which we'll explore the one thing is it's it's extremely difficult to predict where although we can have our, our frictional coefficients which under a range of, of general conditions give us a a good range, you know, a good number of, of what the friction coefficient is going to be. Where coefficients vary much more wildly by by orders of magnitude sometimes, and it's extremely difficult to predict. Um, and high wear and high friction are not always intrinsically linked. Um, so things like polyethylene on steel does have it has high friction, but low wear. Um, so it's a, an example there. So typically we'll measure this by mass loss or volume loss. So you can either weigh these to determine what the mass loss is or use various types of profilometry, either optical or uh, scanning probe, or if you want to get really small, AFM, which we'll come on to a little later. And wear isn't always a bad thing, um, you know, in any mechanical uh, system. Uh, we're typically talking about, you know, we're typically looking at, uh, you know, a planned amount of wear. Um, so initially, during our uh, you know, use of a component, there will be a um, very high wear rate, essentially this running in period. And and for a lot of, a lot of contacts, you, this will be slightly higher friction. But then the wear rate throughout, you know, normal usage, we have what we call normal wear. It's much lower. And then as our component begins to fail because of uh, you know, possibly, you know, an extreme wear mechanism that's happening, fatiguing possibly, um, we get an increase in wear rate until either the component is replaced before failure or the component fails. So and one way to reduce this type, you know, our friction and wear is by lubrication. So either using a solid, liquid, or gas. So typically people would normally think of just solid and liquid, but gas lubrication is, is possible. And this is reduce, reduce friction and or wear during motion. Um, liquids, of course, you can have things like you know, water, various types of oils, um, you know, complex oils and complex oil formulations, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Solid um, solid lubricants, things like graphite, uh, graphene, essentially single layer graphite, MOS2, molybdenum disulfide, which I have a diagram here. So this is um, so where we have um, you know, somewhat uh, somewhat similar to graphite, this single planar um, um, uh, planar structure material, which can slide over each other. So essentially with this, we want it to be plane orientated or what's called basally orientated things. So this is where you have stacks of your uh, lubricant. And uh, because there are low forces between each one of these layers, they can slide with extremely low friction. And then as an example of things like uh, gas lubricants, things like pressurized air in air bearings. 
So used in respirators and hard drives, there's typically a very, very small air film in a, in a hard drive. And I think these are also used in um, once um, in hydroelectric power generators, air bearings are used for that. So once they get spinning, they're extremely low uh, coefficient of friction. So various different lubrication regimes when we're talking about, um, well, typically uh, liquid, uh, liquid solid here. So we have initially our high coefficient of friction, our highest coefficient of friction is in boundary lubrication. So we have almost no or very low uh, fluid separation. So uh, essentially very little surface film there. We move into mixed lubrication where the surfaces are beginning to separate uh, some more. So up to one micron of film thickness. And at this point, friction coefficient is going down. Uh, the diagram that we have here is a Strybeck curve. So uh, we have here is uh, the bottom axis is either represented as specific film thickness, in which case it's a modified Strybeck curve. But this one, we have a more typical Strybeck curve with uh, dynamic viscosity, speed, and load on the bottom axis and then friction coefficient uh, on the y-axis. Once we move into elastohydrodynamic lubrication, so essentially this is uh, full separation of the surfaces and essentially within a constrained environment. Uh, so this is where we get extremely low coefficient of friction. So this, this uh, constraining and uh, pressurization of the uh, of the lubricant um, means that its sliding is extremely uh, extremely efficient, extremely low um, friction coefficient. And then we move into hydrodynamic, where we begin to see uh, a s slow increase in friction coefficient. But this tends to be due to the uh, you know, increased um, uh, increased separation between the surfaces. So we need to start taking into account the fluid properties of the lubricant. So, uh, as I mentioned, you can have various oils. These can be things like uh, natural mineral oils. You can have synthetic oils. Uh, but typically, depending on the situation in which these are employed, we want to um, uh, we want to modify them. Uh, so these can be things like anti-wear additives, like ZDDP, friction modifiers, like MODTC, uh, which will break down to form um, MOS2. Um, so in order to reduce friction and wear, and then there are many others. So things like acid neutralizers, anti-foaming additives, um, viscosity modifiers, emulsifiers. So these are things, uh, so these additives can help uh, tailor a lubricant for a specific application and keep it uh, functioning within the parameters that it is designed to function in for as long as possible. We can do various different uh, bits of tribological analysis. These are the typical kind of tribological factors that we would uh, analyze. So we look at the materials, which I'll, I'll go into, you know, we'll, we'll talk about each one of these individually, the actual surfaces, lubricant or possible lack thereof, and then the operating conditions. So analyzing things like say this, this Yamaha motorcycle gearbox. Through so materials, we need to think about basic material properties. What's the elastic modulus? Because this this tells us about the uh, the contact stiffness, uh, hardness. It tell us the resistance to wear for each one of these materials. Poisson's ratio, yield stress, fatigue strength. All give us limits on the material performance. The friction, you know, the friction um, of the material pairings, the wear resistance of them, the compatibility. So this could be some surfaces just don't like being in contact with each other. These can be things where you're going to have an adverse reaction, like um, it's been noted that diamond like carbon um, can have an adverse reaction with MODTC and can cause somewhat of a, a catalytic breakdown of the diamond like carbon. But this is still being investigated, but there's uh, one example for you if surfaces. I think about the conformity of those surfaces. So high conformity is in high contact between a flat on flat plane. This is high conformity, low conformity. So our, you can imagine a, a ball on flat. So for our, our typical um, Hertzian um, approximations and then surface texture. So you think of these are multiple, um, multiple different uh, parameters to measure surface roughness, uh, texturing. But essentially, we can think about this where we have our unworn surface, 
Um, this is a just a, a typical surface profile where we have you know various uh, asperities. There are you know some are higher than others, whereas during wear, uh, essentially some of these are you know, these are flattened essentially. So this is. Uh, so where we have our, our worn surface, this would be more during our, our typical uh, normal wear where some of these are flattened. And then you would see, um, you know, essentially an actual loss, you know, more of a loss of, of, of volume uh, during wear out and failure of components. The lubricants, so we talked about the various things. So the viscosity, of course, is important. The additives, um, you know, what environment is it tailored to operate in? Contamination, so any uh, particulate matter, any um, any other uh, chemical substance that gets into the lubricant can react, um, can stop the lubricant forming um, proper or performing. Sorry, not forming, performing as it was intended. And degradation. So a lot of these additives will be used up. Things like the anti wear and uh, friction additives uh, will be used up over time. Um, in some cases, these can be replenished. Sometimes they cannot, and this requires replacement of the oil. Operating conditions. So if you imagine this somewhat you know, challenging operating condition of this, of this train here, um, the actual load it's operating, higher load typically would end up with higher wear once, um, or you know, sometimes higher friction, depending on you know, what range we're operating in. Relative motion, um, you know, what's, what mechanism of where or sliding are we considering the temperature? Because uh, this this can also affect mechanical properties. Extremely high temperatures, uh, we get a reduction in hardness, and this can increase wear. And then the environment. So what other what other mitigating factors do we have? Snow in this case, or leaves on a line is another one for trains. So come to another part where I like to ask what's um, before we, before I want to discuss each one of the the wear mechanisms themselves, I'm going to get a little bit more, a uh, little bit more audience feedback. So, let's let's have some um, let's have some uh, some answers for what you think some of the main uh, wear mechanisms are in tribology. Let's just have a let's have a few in the in the chat, please. Yeah, abrasion, abrasion, adhesion, absolutely. Yes, these are for sliding wear. Fatigue, of course, yes. Article generation, yeah. Crack propagation, impact, absolutely. Fretting, yes, yes. Pitting and scuffing, yep. Those are ones, yes. Yeah, so these pitting and scuffing are quite interesting. They're typically not generally thought of as fundamental wear. Corrosion, absolutely. Galling. So pitting. Pitting, scuffing, galling. Typically, these are extremes of other types of wear mechanisms. So, um, yeah, I think you've got abrasion, adhesion, fatigue, corrosion, prowess, erosion. So, erosion, corrosion, that's a synergistic one. So, I'll talk about that one. So, thank you all. <laughs> thank you all very much. Let's, let's go on. So, our main ones typically we have abrasion, adhesion, erosion, corrosion, and fatigue. We'll cover each one of these separately. And then we have synergistic wear mechanisms like fretting, impact, erosion, corrosion as one. Um, so with uh, with these, I have adhesion, so essentially Bowden and Tabor formulated that we have during contact, we have cold welding of asperities. Um, we have to have a shear uh, to occur uh, for actual sliding um, to happen. So... You can think of this in terms of uh, a theoretical expression by by R charge. So we have our, our total wear volume per unit distance. So our load, uh, or P, sorry, which is uh, think of as number of contact spots over a whole um, um, over an entire contact. Uh, pi A squared. So essentially, what are the the area of these contacts? And then H for the um, hardness divided by three H. So that's our, our theoretical. Um, uh, our theoretical expression for adhesive wear, but then when we um, we look into that a little bit more, we can adapt this into a much more general form, where we can look at where we can establish a wear coefficient. So, um, load, sliding distance, P and X, hardness, H and K, which is our dimensionless wear coefficient, 
And then we can have large coach or dimensional wear coefficient. So that's uh, our wear volume divided by PX. And this allows us to generate our walls of adhesive wear, um, which again, are typically only only true in in sort of macro scale conditions. You know, when you go to nano scale, things operate a little differently because we don't have multiple asperity contacts. But uh, so once we have our wear volume is proportional to sliding distance, and also proportional to load, and inversely proportional to the hardness of the softer material. Sorry for the typos, um, but uh, yes. So essentially, we we expect that the harder material. Um, won't wear, won't wear as readily just because it is more resistant to plastic deformation. Abrasion, so essentially we can think of this, this is our, our plowing. So for some of you that said plowing there, so we can think of this like a, like a, uh, like a groove um, by hard asperity. Think of that asperity, model that as a, uh, um, essentially as, as a cone in 3D or as a section of a triangle in, uh, in 2D. So our volume is two times the load. The uh, tan of the the angle of that triangle, uh, pi h again for our hardness. So in more simplistic terms, we just think of two bodies plow, uh, abrading against each other, one hard surface onto a softer surface, and then uh, three bodies. So we have um, so when we have um, wear particles generated. Um, these are typically hard, they could be hard oxidized particles. So this uh, increases the wear just by other particles being in the abrasive contact. We have erosion. So typically the impingement of solid or liquid onto a surface. So this can generate uh, fatigue. It can also have uh, so cutting. So I think we had some, uh, someone said cutting in the, the chat. So depending on the angularity of the particles, Thus, this can uh, can remove um, uh, can remove material from the surface. Uh, for more ductile materials, we get more fatigue wear dominated erosion with more brittle materials. We get more uh, crack generation that generates uh, wear particles. There are various other different types. Typically, we would just think of this as uh, uh, solid particles within um, liquid or gas stream, but we can have fluid erosion as well. So extremely high, uh, high speed fluid droplets hitting a surface, cavitation erosion, where you have the collapse of vapor bubbles or spark erosion, where you have uh, material removal and then redeposition due to electric sparks between surfaces. Uh, hello for those just joining us. Uh, erosion is not also, is not just, um, is, is not just contained to, to earth. There's, you know, there's, there are, high-speed particles in space, so things like atomic oxygen um, can be extremely wearing in space. This is a, an, an image of a, a NASA mission where they, they took, you know, various different materials, put them outside of, uh, I believe, outside of the International Space Station, so um, on, an, on an outstretched uh, part of that, and then looked at the, um, looked at the atomic, uh, atomic oxygen emission um or atomic oxygen erosion wear sorry of those so very very interesting so this can have uh this can both remove material depending on that and also change material properties if um you know if you get you get really uh if you get really high um particle emission onto them of corrosion um chemical wear so essentially chemical reactions that remove material or sometimes form Material, so we have uh, oxides forming. We have uh, quite extreme corrosion of certain bits. We have uh, specific phases on the materials changing. This can generate tensile stresses within it that can cause cracking or stress corrosion cracking. Uh, tribal corrosion, so where you have removement, uh, removal of materials uh, along with corrosion. So this is a synergistic mechanism. So where you can have uh, like sliding wear causing some corrosion or oxidation that's then causing or generating more sliding particles. So again, these are synergistic wear mechanisms. Fatigue, so essentially this is crack formation uh, by cyclic stresses, typically below the, tensile str uh, below the tensile strength and often it's below the yield strength of the material. But this can change depending on the cycle of fatigue. Typically, we think of high cycle fatigue as below yield of the component with extremely high cycles greater than 10 to the 4, whereas low cycles, um, low cycle fatigue generally, this is where you're going to generate wear far faster. Um, 
greater than the yield of the component, much lower cycles, so much larger um, wear, or it, wear generated far faster, sorry. There's synergistic wear, so again, a lot of these mechanisms do not happen alone. It's, it's, very, it's very rare that you'd say, okay, that is, that's just abrasion. That's it. it typically, um, tribological contexts are complex. The analysis that goes along with this is complex, and a lot of the wear that occurs is um, is complex, and um, multiple wear mechanisms happening at once. Uh, things like you know adhesion and abrasion, where we have wear particles uh, generated by adhesion detach, and then abrade in three body uh, abrasion. Uh, corrosion and abrasion. So like I was saying before, reactant particles from the corrosion are often harder if you generate oxidized particles. And then this is three body, three body abrasion, erosion, corrosion, where you're eroding a surface, but this is typically under, under liquid, possibly on a, on a material, a ferrous material that can, that can rust. So you're getting, you know, iron changing to, to various forms of iron oxide. that are also breaking off. Um, yeah, it's uh, this can be very complex things. We have other um, typically synergistic wear mechanisms, things like fretting, where you have um, typically very very high cycle um, low displacement oscillatory wear. Um, so generally, you think of a fretting contact as a, a it though there's a lot of analysis that goes into fretting, and I don't want to over I do not want to oversimplify it, but you could think of it as a, a much smaller uh, displacement reciprocating sliding contact, though there are different modes of, of fretting. Essentially, there is, there's always a region that is, uh, that remains um, uh, covered by the contact. So you get uh, both fatigue and wear particle generation during fretting. Uh, depending on your load and displacement amplitude, you can get partial slip. So typically where you're, you're, you're almost remaining on the surface, this is much more, um, fatigue dominated as we have our with our material response fretting map as we get into to mixed fretting you're beginning to generate more wear particles and then into gross slip which is the largest displacement fretting mode you're in you're creating the most wear particles um but there's still an element of fatigue there uh but there are multiple there are multiple movement modes in fretting tangential radial rotational or torsional um, and we can typically think of these uh, think of these sort of friction loops, um, which we can extend into 3D. So we have friction force and relative displacement. You can put cycle number, so essentially make what's called a friction log. Um, so essentially, these are normally displayed in in full 3D, and a lot of they're there in a lot of fretting papers. So there are multiple elements of these. So we can look at the um, uh, the stick of the the surface. Um, we can look at the, the integral of um, of the uh, of the loop to get our energy displacement. Um, we have our, our full sliding, the top and bottom, and then the um, then the actual change, sort of essentially on the sides, which is either which is angle depending on which way you're you're moving. Uh, but you can look at these for um, reciprocating sliding contacts, um, which Nisha will show you a little a little later. Um, we have some results here. So these are some results that I generated during my PhD. So this is various different types of, of DLCs. So uh, hydrogenated uh, A, silicon doped B, tungsten doped C, and then our completely uncoated um, M2 tool steel there at the top. So generally extremely high uh, fretting friction coefficient, um, uncoated, and then much lower um, coefficients of friction for our diamond carbon, much lower wear, um, generation of smaller wear particles, a lot more oxidation. Uh, so these were, this is against uh, 52100 steel, uh, just to give a bit more context to these results. Uh, so impact wear, so, so things like looking at um, fracture resistance, so high strain rate testing, so Charpy or Izod impact tests on very large scale. So you can look at notch toughness, and then we can extend this um, to the smaller scale, nano or micro impact testing. So typically for thin films, but very useful for um, uh, for bulk materials as well. So you can use blunter probes to look at fatigue or sharper probes to look at fracture resistance. So you have uh, some images there 
um, of again some of my materials um, on micro scale impact testing. So we can see some um, different levels of cracking between the uh, between the two materials. So I have our, our silicon doped there on the left, tungsten doped. Excuse me, there on the right. Um, okay, so that is the uh, that's that's we come to pretty much all the coverage of the the wear um, of fundamental bits of wear, and I just want to talk a little bit about um, some of our, our next workshops. So we have our, our next uh, next workshops, next webinar, beginning with next webinar. So the registration link for that should be on screen now. Uh, so we have Dr. Uh, Maren Mosen from uh, University College London uh, talking about the mechanical characterization of biological tissues. Uh, you can also find this, uh, the registration link on the Surface Ventures, uh, Surface Ventures website. So please go there as well. You can find that there. Um, now moving on to our next, our next workshop. So let me get the, uh, there you go. So we'll be running another one specifically looking at surface characterization. So looking a little bit more <clears throat> in detail on the, um, uh, on Surface uh, surface roughness parameters, um, mechanical characterization of surfaces. Um, so with our optical profile nano indenter demo, and a little bit uh, about the various different types of spectroscopy methods that you could use for surface characterization. So um, please do do look out for uh, for that. Um, you can sign up to the uh, Surface Ventures mailing list on the website, and there will be an announcement uh, of the registration going out for that there. So uh, I'd like to dedicate just a, a couple of minutes to, uh, or a few minutes to just some, some questions if we have. Um, okay, so we've got one there. So is there a way of measuring the wear rate using the nano scratch nano wear tester by micro materials? So if you're talking nano scratch itself, um, so typically the, the micro materials unit um, will use a, a three pass methodology. So topography, scan, topography. So your first scan will get you your, um, so unworn surface. So they use a very low, uh, very low load uh, scan at first. Then they will do a ramp, typically a lot ramped load scratch. And then uh, they will do a post scan topography. So you can get the actual, uh, you can get the actual profile um, of the scratch afterwards. Uh, of course, this is a single probe. Um, I believe the the nano test system does have an AFM option. If you want to, uh, you can then use that afterwards. Um, typically, what I've done for or what I did for some uh, nano scratch characterization, which um, as I was using the micromaterials um, unit, was to use a confocal microscope or use an optical um, some kind of optical profilometry. Um, um, yeah, so white white inf interferometer um, will be a good way to to do that. Um, again, has to be high resolution for the nano scratch, but there is there is some amount of um, of wear built into that. And there are also there are other parameters you can use, such as uh, pile up and sink in. So if you do line scans across different various different parts of the the scratch test, you can look at ratios of pile up to sink in during scratch. It's quite useful for for different materials characterization. Uh, any other questions? Then I think we can go to um, we can go to our our demo. Again, we'll have another Q and A session um, with Nishil to answer questions specifically on the equipment. But I think for uh, oh, uh, before we go to that, let's just cover a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of information about the. Um, uh, you know, how we measure, what techniques we use for actually measuring tribological testing. So typically what we want to do is try and simplify the conditions down as much as possible. Um, so mimic what the real life conditions are. So looking at contact pressure, um, you know, material pairings, presence of lubricant, things like that. So these can be in various different modes. Um, uh, we have our, our pin on disc on the left, um, angular reciprocating there are linear reciprocating. Uh, so we have a typical friction trace here. So this is quite similar to uh, to one of the, so what's going to be shown in the demo. So we have a, a bearing steel there, 100 CR6, uh, through hardening steel 
against a titanium nitride coated um, steel. If, uh, look at wear measurements, so profilometry, um, for very small scale um, wear, you can use AFMs, but otherwise these are typically used for um, uh, surface scanning. Look at the wear of the actual ball, the counterface material. Um, things like this, where we have a, a nice, neat, um, sort of neater ball on flat contact. We can look at that. We can measure the wear of the ball using a spherical cap. So measure the diameter of that, and then we can extrapolate that to sort of say, okay, how much wear volume was lost from what was once a, a nice uh, curved surface. Um, Anton Parr make um, various different types of tribometers. What will be shown today on the left is the pin on disc. So with normal forces up to 60 Newtons, measuring frictional force up to 20. Uh, there's a high temperature variant of this, uh, capable of measuring up to 1,000 degrees. So this is very useful for, um, you know, for looking at engine tribology, for example. Um, uh, so I have another question there, so I'll, I'll come to, to answer that one a little, a little later. Um, so for engine tribology, for example, we have a nanotribometer. So again, for reducing the scale of those contacts, we're looking at very fundamental um, uh, fundamental or very low friction systems with a much more sensitive um, uh, friction sensor there. So from five micronewtons to uh, one newton, 1,000 millinewtons. Um, so uh, range of humidity, uh, Nisha will be able to answer that. So we'll, I'll mark that one for him. Thank you for your question. Um, so this is quite so humidity tribometer quite useful for polymers, for example, whose properties can vary in humidity, and our vacuum tribometer quite useful for space applications or um, solid lubricants. Um, so yeah, same load range, but with vacuum level up to ten to the minus seven millibar. And these um, the tribometer's key features. So we have minimized thermal drifts. There's two friction sensors. I'll, I'll bring up a diagram of that in a moment. Um, there's environmental monitoring, so it can monitor temperature throughout, monitor humidity throughout. Um, calibration is quite simple, uh, conforms to all of the uh, the standards that we expect. Um, the software is uh, wonderfully easy to use. You can look at friction loops. You can get uh, very fast data export. Um, there's a modeling software for looking at contact mechanics. It's extremely useful for when you want to look about, look at, and think about the um, the stresses in your contact. Um, where does yield occur in the contact? And it's a modular design as well, which Nisha will will uh, will show different module four. And as I said, two friction sensors. So Nisha will show this in in, in much more detail and actually live in a in a moment. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, a little bit on the AFM. So the Tosca series, topographic scanners. So typically for generating um, a nanometer level, nanometer um, scale, sorry, just marking questions there. Um, uh, nanometer scale scans, although can be used for um, very small scale um, wear volume calculation. Uh, you can determine various surface properties with that. So these can be multiple things like um, adhesion between surfaces with uh, pull-off forces, um, uh, tapping, scanning mode, extremely low. Um, AFM can be used for, for friction um, uh, testing as well. Uh, this can be very, uh, uh, very quick measurements. It's a highly automated system and with extremely high resolution of course, depending on the exact tip that you use. The so principle of, of measurement for an AFM. Um, so we have a cantilever arm that scans across the surface. Um, AFMs, can, AFMs can work in either a, a sort of scanning mode or you're just scanning or a tapping mode. This pulls across the surface. There's a laser scan, um, laser shining onto the, um, onto the cantilever. And as that cantilever shifts position, as it uh, moves across the surface. This is projected onto a photodiode, um, which measures that actual change in, um, change in, in, um, in surface roughness throughout scanning. And this information is sent to the controller and to the PC. And you can assemble a uh, 3D map of the surface from this. 
So there are two models typically. There's the Tosca 400 for larger samples. So we have uh, here's that uh, thing about um, about scan size. So um, 100 by 100 uh, microns with a Z range of 15 for the 400, or 50 by 50 and 10. Uh, but these can be upgraded slightly larger for the uh, 200, both to 90 by 90 or 12 to 15 for the Z scanner. Um, at the full scan, um, fully addressable range, 100 millimeters and 50 respectively, uh, 10 lines per second versus five, 25 millimeters maximum height. Um, there is once again, uh, very fully featured uh, analysis software included, and there are various different modes available for this. Um, without going into there, I don't want to go into too much detail because again, that could be a whole a workshop or a lecture on its own on the uh, the various different types of modes. Uh, I'll mark that question there. So for initial to answer on the dry or lubricated conditions. So I'd like to now invite. Nishil on, so let me just invite him on stage. Remove the uh, slides for a moment. Okay, so before we begin, and while Nishil is just loading in, so we'll first show the uh, tribometer, and then um, we'll be just swapping camera positions over to the um, over to the AFM. So while we're doing that, I'll just uh, pause Nishil's video, but I'll, without further ado, let him uh, let him begin. So uh, please take it away. Thank you, Sam. Thanks very much for a fantastic introduction and taste of uh, the world of wear and tribology, which is not an easy subject by any means. Um, so my name is Nishal Malde. Uh, I'm a product manager at Anton Parr. Uh, I specialize in actually materials characterization. Um, and you know, welcome to everyone here. Um, thank you for giving up your valuable time. So what I'm going to run through actually is a little bit more hands-on, the instruments that are used to actually you know, determine wear, friction, and also, if you're going onto a smaller scale, the nano scale, uh, more kind of surface profile, surface features using the AFM. So I'm going to start off with our pin-on-disc tribometer, and then I'm going to move on to the atomic force microscope as well. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of uh, movement on the on the camera. I apologise, but I want you to get a very very clear opportunity to see what a pin-on-disc tribometer. If you're not familiar. Uh, I'm sure many of you probably are. Okay, so this is a uh, setup of a pin on disc tribometer. Um, sorry, I'm going to come off of shot, but at least you can see the setup here. I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit as well. Okay, so what you have here is, as Sam suggested, you have a symmetric uh, arm. Okay, it's an elastic arm. Okay, and you've got two. Uh, um, sensors to measure lateral force deflection. So that means that kind of force there. You've got typically, it's called pin on disc, but it doesn't have to be pin. It could be ball on disc, it could be flat on disc. Um, it could be a variety of uh, geometries that you can have two body contact. You have one um, body uh, is in static, the other is mobile. They usually the sample under being under test. Um, here, generally, traditionally, pin or disc tribometers tend to use dead weights, okay? So dead weights that you apply rather than having actuated uh, loading. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to both, both techniques, but the, the, the most advantage factor of a dead weight is that you always have constant uh, load or contact pressure um, on the sample surface, irrespective of any um, surface roughness. Um, Talking of about contact pressure, that, as you probably are aware, and as Sam has uh, alluded to, is determined by your uh, normal force, the load that you apply, and your contact area and that provides contact pressure. So typically, we talk in terms of contact pressure. Um, what I've got here set up on the tribometer is a rotational module. Uh, our, tri our, our tribometers, as uh, Sam mentioned, are modular. So we've got a number of modular features that we can add. So at the moment, we've got a rotational stage on here. So you can uh, simulate, and keep in mind, tribology is all about simulation, to simulate rotative motion or movement. That could be rotation in one direction or another direction, 
or any kind of angular reciprocation as well to provide some sort of wear and wear track. Um, we could mount a uh, onboard performance. We've got a, a micro performance that goes on here. So in situ, you can actually determine uh, the wear uh, track, wear depth, and this instrument will calculate the, the wear rates on your material. Um, uh, as Sam mentioned, on board we have the ability to measure the environmental temperature, not necessarily on the surface, but the environmental temperature and the humidity. Uh, but if you wanted to do simulations in different conditions, this particular system or systems like this, we can go from minus 100 degrees up to 450 degrees in temperature. Um, uh, we can also have a situation where we can apply a inert gas into the enclosure to provide a uh, a, a stable um, non um, affecting environment, maybe like uh, uh, nitrogen, where if you've got oxidation effects as well. Um, so that kind of gives you hopefully a, a, an out, a outline uh, of you know how we've got this set up. Um, at the moment, what I've got here is a ball on a disc. This is uh, a, um, a titanium nitride coated uh, steel sample. Uh, the coating is probably around right about um, six to eight microns, so it's not very, very thick. Um, I've got a six mil uh, diameter ball and I've got about three newtons of load. So three newtons of load on the six mil diameter ball. The six mil, you may ask, is part of the uh, one of the ASTMs, the G33, actually that's what makes it conform. Um, I spoke about modularity. Uh, I'm going to move on to the, looking at some of the software as well. But here, just wanted to give you an idea. You can see what we've got here is that we can take the rotational, we can take the rotational uh, mechanism out and replace it with this module, which is a linear slider. So what we're doing here is simulating sliding wear. Okay, so we can do uh, reciprocating linear sliding or fretting. Okay, as it's known as well, okay, by swapping out the module. And the module is very, very easy to swap out. It takes literally a few minutes to do that and set up. Um, we've got other uh, modules. If you want to do uh, um, um, topological measurements in a lubricant, in a liquid lubricant, we've got liquid holding cups um, for both uh, sliding and rotational. If you wanted to do um, erosion, we've got uh, ele electro erosion cells as well. So you can apply a current. Um, to expedite the corrosion effect uh, in either in or without a lubricant to test um, the um, frictional wear properties as well. But fundamentally what you're doing here is that you're measuring two parameters. You're measuring basically um, the load that you're applying, okay, which is static in this way, or the contact pressure, should I say, and any lateral movement of that elastic arm. Okay, um, And that, elast that elastic uh, movement is translated by the LVD sensors, the sensors that Sam mentioned, into an electrical signal, and we convert that into a coefficient of friction value. So I'm going to move over to show you just the software side a little bit. Okay, um, I'd love to go into more detail, but you know it's one of these uh, subjects that you can um, talk about um, this for all day long. Okay, so I appreciate you're not going to be able to make out everything on the screen. But here is a typical example of some cyclic uh, wear and friction measurements that we've done. So we've cycled around about um, over uh, 500 seconds and we've done multiple cycles. We've done about 20, uh, 20 plus cycles on this uh, uh, particular material that I showed you. Um, and here we can see the evolution of the um, the, the, the wear and how the coefficient of friction changes. Um, and what the R software allows you to do is analyze these, this, day, this information in terms of number of cycles or individual cycles and look at some statistical variations. Um, so you can actually look at a certain area of positive and negative part of the cycling um, to determine how that coefficient of friction or wear uh, uh, evolves. And like any good uh, instrument or software, you've got lots of flexibility in terms of what you can achieve in terms of setting up the measurement. You know, you can set the number of cycles, number of laps, you know, sliding time, sliding distance. For example, um, you know, your um, 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 there's there's a number of actual um, 
parameters you can vary um, and in this this corner of the of the software um, if you've got the onboard profit performator or you've got something you know uh, 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 a dedicated performator you can take the information about the the, the wear depth information put that into this and it will calculate the wear rate for you both on the uh, test sample and the, the static body that you're uh, in contact with. Um, all of this information, uh, including the experimental parameters and the information about the sample is stored uh, in an in a, in a, in a ASCII formatted uh, a file that you can also analyze in anything like Excel or MATLAB or uh, whatever, whatever you feel that is prevalent for you. The other um, nice feature of our software is that we've we've got Python scripting uh, available, so you can write a script as well, which can extract the data, take into say an Excel sheet that you've created with um, uh, uh, say certain certain um, uh, 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 fit uh, parameter for the for the for model and apply that onto the data and get some statistical information from there as well. But yeah, we you know typically we'll measure the uh, coefficient of friction. Uh, the lateral force, the normal force, penetration depth, uh, and a number of other features as well. Um, there are also two uh, additional user channels on here that you've got access to. So what you can do is here is say connect, um, say a thermocouple and measure the local temperature on the sample surface or the sample uh, volume. Um, or or um, some you know uh, another example is you can. Um, put say maybe so some spectroscopic uh, um, measurement on there to measure any kind of uh, chemical variation as well. Or maybe you want to take some high speed photography or imaging to see the evolution of the wear and the wear track from the beginning to the end, um, which is quite nice. And that can be all triggered from the instrument and the software as well. So um, hopefully this kind of given you a little bit of a flavor of how a typical pin on disk tribometer is arranged and set up. Um, this is obviously a commercial system, a commercial instrument, which is basically complies to, as a SAMHSA number of ASTM standards, and meets those standards, uh, and in many cases exceeds those standards as well. Um, and being a modular system it allows you great flexibility and opportunity to um, uh, expand on your tribological measurements as you progress in terms of your research or understanding of your material systems and mechanisms. Um, so um, I think uh, it's probably a good point to maybe move on uh, to looking at the uh, AFM. Uh, and then I'm happy to take any questions or, or, or focus on something a little bit, you know, on those questions. OK, okay Nishal, do you want to uh, go ahead and get uh, reset up for the AFM? I'll just sure, uh, I'll move from stage while you're moving the camera. Okay, so go ahead and, and rejoin once uh, once you're ready. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay also while we're uh, while we're just waiting for initial to, to reposition his camera, I'd just like to um, launch another poll question. Um, just whether you would like to uh, like to receive uh, some further information from Anton Parr regard regarding uh, various uh, products and events. Um, Thank you all for answering the uh, the poll questions. Uh, if any of you still remaining uh, haven't answered some of these, um, I would greatly appreciate it if you uh, if you could do so. Um, oh, got another question there. So any other questions we ask? So please, while we're uh, just while we're waiting, if you do have any other questions, um, equipment specific, uh, please go ahead and and ask those, and we'll cover those with Nisha in a in a moment once he's ready. And also, just while we're uh, while we're waiting here, um, if, you, if anyone wants to uh, once again just open in open in another tab to to, to uh, take a look at some further information um, on some of this equipment, um, the Anton Parr website is there for you to do so. Um, I'll also release um, some handouts from Anton Parr a little later, also. All right.
Okay. Initial should be ready in a moment. He's just reconnected. Right. Hello. Apologies for that. Uh, there were slight technical glitches. I moved. Ah. Okay. I um, hope you can hear me and uh, oh. see the image of, of the setup of the AFM. Um, so this is the Tosca uh, AFM, uh, Tosca 400, that Sam uh, uh, mentioned in his presentation. Um, so if you're going down in length scale, down to the nanometer range scale, uh, and you want to measure surface properties, uh, surface texture, surface roughness, surface features, uh, or want to have a better understanding on your wear, uh, very on a, on a small nano scale or atomic scale, uh, your your kind of go-to option uh, would be an AFM system, um, and this is a typical setup of an AFM system here. Um, what you have, as um, uh, as uh, uh, Sam mentioned, you have a cantilever, and um, that cantilever is basically like a sharp point, uh, typically, and that. Uh, um, is either in contact or it could be non-contact and it moves across a defined area that you're of interest um, and it takes information on the topical, topological information um, and there's a laser that's uh, on the back of that cantilever and that any deflection that it picks up as it's moving across the sample surface is picked up and cr creates an image of that uh, area of interest. Um, um, the AFM has got other a multitude of uh, uh, features as well. You can do uh, mechanical properties, adhesion measurements, you know, um, um, uh, indentation, lift type of uh, measurements to look at adhesion properties. Uh, you can do electrical conductivity, magnetic conductivity, temperature, uh, KPFM, um, and there's a whole magnitude of options uh, available on on AFMs to measure uh, surface pro properties on a nano to atomic scale. Um, what we've got set up here is the uh, AFM um, in a uh, acoustic enclosure because if you're going to go down to atomic um, uh, level in terms of measurement, you, you want to isolate any kind of uh, sound or acoustic vibration. Um, we've got a both a active and passive noise cancelling system here. As you can see, it's on a on a on a, on a bench, uh, on an isolation bench, with active and uh, um, a passive uh, noise cancelling um, to give very very high. This is how we can achieve very very high resolution images. Um, I'm just going to move over. Uh, um, what you can see, hopefully, I mean, I'll show you. That's the. I'm just going to point to you. That's actually the actuator body, and that's where. It, the cantilever is held, uh, the sample is underneath that, and I'll show you an image of that in the software now as well, so you can see for yourself. So I'm gonna try and position this as best as I can, uh, so you can see for yourselves. Okay, so here you can see we have one sample in a large area. This is around about uh, nine to 10 centimeters in diameter. Typically, you could put a, uh, a if you're working in the semiconductor industry, for example, you could put a, semi, uh, a silicon wafer in there, but that's just one uh, sample that's been shown. Let me just zoom in a little bit. You can probably make out, it's just one sample there. And the it's got features on this sample, Okay, it's got um, uh, defined 22 uh, micron uh, steps uh, graduated on, on the sample. Um, and I'm working at the moment in contact mode, so I've got a contact cantilever in there. Um, and um, what you can see is in this image, that's where the laser is on the back of that, that cantilever. Okay, so the laser is hitting on the back of that cantilever. And what we will see here is some typical data. Um, I, I ran this at really a fast rate, um, so um, you won't see much features at the moment because I'm not in the right area. But um, but what you'll see, you'll get information in terms of height. Okay, you, you know, you do a rastering, 
of scan so you do a raster scan so you go backwards and forwards uh, as the probe goes uh, across the defined area of the, of, of the sample that you want to or area that you want to measure um, you'll have a vertical deflection in this area here uh, and then you'll have your lateral deflection so lateral deflection is typically similar or pseudo similar to measuring a coefficient of friction so if you've got uh, features or uh, properties on your sample whether they're engineered or chemically introduced on the surface uh, either wanted or not wanted you'll pick that up in terms of its coefficient of friction properties here as well from the lateral deflection so you've got you're measuring three channels of information and those three channels are then put together uh, to create uh, information uh, uh, on that defined area uh, of your sample surface and that could have certain features maybe directional those directional features could be uh, both in the lateral or even height as well on the vertical um, that you'll be able to kind of determine um, so good one good example is um, uh, um, like if you have gloves uh, protective gloves on one side of the gloves it's smooth on the side on your palm side there's a bit of roughness to give you a little bit of grip um, so the, the friction and wear properties are going to be different on one side of those gloves for example to the other side um, and if you were trying to measure the engineered features on the rough side typically uh, an AFM would be a good place to start um, another area is potentially maybe um, in say uh, contact lenses okay because you're looking at small scale you've got very thin coatings to provide uh, comfort to reduce that friction uh, properties when you're wearing contact lenses for example and again an AFM is a very well suited um, uh, uh, technique to, to, to determine those properties um, so again um, I've provided you a, um, a kind of a, a small window, really. Um, it probably doesn't do uh, uh, justice uh, because, you know, we could spend uh, a whole day talking about AFM and another whole day talking about the setup of a, a, a tribometer. But they're both kind of complementing techniques in many ways, um, especially if you're measuring uh, wear properties or frictional properties as well, uh, depending on your length scales. Um, I think um, I would probably wrap the demonstration up uh, at this point and uh, take any questions that you may have uh, and you know expand on those. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Nisho. Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead with the uh, questions. So, or sorry, I'll let you uh, sorry, adjust. Really just, okay. There we go. Right, so we've got our first one here, which is, can we perform high temperature lubrication experiments, excuse me, with this AFM? Uh, um, there, there, there is a module that's being uh, developed at the moment uh, uh, for, the, for this particular AFM to do high temperature measurements. Um, I'm not sure whether we can be able to do it in a lubricated environment, but it, potentially we are looking at a wet environment. So I suspect, when you join the two together, it possibly uh, can happen. But there are caveats because if you've got heat, you've got a lubricant or a liquid, there's going to be evaporation, and we need to be able to mitigate what you're measuring. Um, are you measuring effects of evaporation? Uh, remember, you've got something that potentially could be in contact with the cantilever or a non-contact, but uh, we, we, we're running some um, uh, tests at the moment before release. Uh, you know, uh, watch this space, as people say. <laughs> okay, got another question here, which is in tribometers with rotating bases um, at high RPMs, won't the lubricant poured move away from the contact point due to centrifugal forces? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. a good question. Yeah, absolutely, it's a good question. So our tribometers, when you're working with a, say, a liquid environment, a lubricant with, you know, a viscosity involved, and um, it's contained in a, in a, in a, uh, either, depending on, we've got two types, we've got aluminium cup or we've got a stainless steel cup, depending on the reaction. Um, as soon as you do any kind of lubricant measurement, you can reduce your RPM, your rotational speed, anything from, it goes from zero up to 2000 RPM and you can bring that down. You can actually predefine 
your uh, measurement protocol for any kind of test like that, where you're minimizing that kind of uh, centrifugal forces that move and separate the liquid away um, to down to very, very low RPMs. So of course the measurement will take a little bit longer. Okay. Um, however, you will have a little bit more data integrity when you're working in that kind of situation or, so, or simulation. Okay, so you have another one here. I think this is for the uh, was the for the pin on disk. But uh, can it do high temperature and gaseous state experiments also? Um, it, it can do high temperature. Yes, it, I mean uh, this particular pin on disk can go up to four hundred fifty degrees uh, in dry uh, and two hundred degrees in in, in mm -hmm. wet or liquid conditions or lubric conditions. Um, in terms of the gaseous environment, it depends on what gases you're talking about. It can. This particular pin on disk can handle uh, inert gases. So um, if you're going to be working with gases that are maybe reactive, uh, then probably not. But if you're working with like argon, nitrogen, you know, air, it should, there should be no problems whatsoever. Um, if you want to do in a gaseous environment at high temperature, then we've got the dedicated, um, say, the vacuum. Uh, tribometer that uh, Sam mentions, and that can also elevate to high temperatures as well, around about 450 degrees. So that would be the the kind of go-to setup. Um, it's one of these uh, situations where, uh, in an ideal environment, you want an instrument that does everything in one 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 setup. But the the, ch the the challenges with that in terms of the technicalities, in terms of materials that you can use, uh, and based on versus performance, and obviously versus budgets as well. So we've got to be mindful of that. Um, and that's why we have these separations in the instruments as well. Hopefully that answers your questions. If you if you if you have an idea what kind of gases environments and then maybe I can uh, provide a little bit more feedback offline. Yes, I mean if anyone has any um specific questions that they uh that they would like uh, to be passed on to uh, to Nishio, please, uh, you can email me at uh, sam at surfaceventures.org. I will pass any questions along. Um, uh, sorry, Nishio, I can't, really, can't remember your email address right off the top of my head right now, but um, you can uh, actually, while we're answering questions, I can find that and put that in the chat if you're happy for, um, if you're happy for. Uh, yeah, yeah, please, yeah, yeah, you can share my, it's just nishio.malde at anton-par.com. There we go. I'll uh, put that in the chat in a moment. So I've got another question here. Uh, how much depth of surface is analyzed by the AFM? I guess they mean what's the the maximum um, yeah, range? That, I mean, that, yeah, that, that goes down to your, uh, typically your kind of um, uh, Z range, your Z, Z, Z resolution. So on, on ours, you can, you, you, you would have seen this like, you know, 15, uh, you know, um, um, microns uh, of resolution. But it all depends on what materials you're measuring, because if you're measuring, say, a polymeric surface, and that polymeric surface has got some sort of recovery, um, then you're going to have that that kind of uh, uh, and the speed of recovery in some cases. Um, you know, you're not going to get that full range of depth, for example. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's 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 it it really depends on 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 the on the on the surface roughness that you've got. The type of material that you're the, the, the surface material that you're looking at um they have an effect on that so but obviously you've got the the specification values that um sam sam showed on, on the presentation um and you can see that even from our website as well if you if you, if you search on there um yeah yep uh so we got Excuse me, another one here. Um, what is the it's data per second? But I guess the the measurement frequency uh, for friction on the um, this was for the tribometer, I believe. But if you have, yeah, it, yeah. So it, um, yeah, te so basically that that's your 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 um, frequency of of data acquisition. I'm guessing if if I'm correct, if I understand that. I, I so, so that's something that's that's a, yeah, that's a variable that you can change. Um, so you can change that um, rate. So typically, if you're doing a very short measurement and you want a lot of data within that, you can increase that frequency. You know, you can go up to you know, uh, if I believe it's around about uh, just under 10 um, kilohertz, you can go up to. Okay, but if you're going to do a very long experiment, you know, some experiments can last even a week, um, then 
the question is, do you want that high rate of data acquisition? Then you can go down to say 30, 40, 50 Hertz, for example. So it's from the Hertz to the kilohertz range, let's put it that, put it that way. So yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a variable that a user can uh, define. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have another question there. Oh, that's the dryer could be used for lubricated environments. Um, so we've covered already the uh, Tromotor can do uh, both dry and lubricated. Yep, so absolutely, can, yeah, it can do both. We'll, yeah. uh, cover that one already. Uh, so there's one here. Can the area under a post topography depth versus scanning distance correlate to the amount of wear that occurred during progressive nano scratch test? So I think that's, I think that's one for me for the, um, what I talked about, um, um, just with regards to nano scratch. I mean, yes, the deeper, um, obviously, the the deeper a um, a scratch is, the more uh, the more wear volume you're actually going to you're going to have uh, displaced. Keep this, you know, with, when analyzing this, you'll have to keep in mind the actual dimensions of the probe that you were using, um, in which to make that scratch. Um, I would say, however, you know, material property dependent. Um, you can't just say, okay, here's the depth, therefore here's the, the volume. It would be, you know, for a nano scratch, um, I think it would be a little bit too simplistic to just say that's, you know, that, you know, you could sort of extrapolate to a volume from um, what the probe is, you know, from knowing the dimensions of the probe. So I'd say definitely do, um, you know, post-test, um, you know, for things like a, you know, a nano scratch, an AFM would work quite well for that, so long as it's within the the measurement range of the, um, you know, of the AFM, or if it become, you know, if it's a little bit more extreme in terms of scratch testing, um, things like um, scan, you know, white light scanning or white light inter interferometers are quite good for that. Uh, also, Sam, you should mention that, that there's you get spallation effects as well if you when you're course, when you're yeah. when you're scratching. So you don't only just have material moving forward, but you have material moving outward as well. So um, and hence why uh, good scratch testers, if you're going to measure real depth profile, as you mentioned, you'd have a pre-scan, a low, very low load, or your defined length. Uh, you'd, you'd apply, do the scratch, and do a post-scan. And when you subtract that information you get a value but of course that's still not necessarily a absolute value of of volume yeah you'd have to do some sort of profile measurement to give you that and even that has caveats to it as well because how many how many sections do you measure on average as well mm -hmm. because you're, you're you're assuming uniformity and homogeneity as well otherwise mm, absolutely sorry that's just my my, my no, opinion. I mean, that's, yes, very good, very good point to mention as well. I kind of, yeah, somewhat oversimplified in my answer. There is, yeah, scratches or scratch, scratch analysis is a complex thing. The, you know, the, yeah. the forces and, and everything that's uh, occurring during a scratch test are, are quite complex. So, yeah, all good things to keep in mind. So another one here, what is the most convenient method to measure the thickness of a coating at the micro scale? Um, so again, there are okay. multiple. Sorry, Nishal, do you can want I, to can I, go ahead? Yeah, yeah. if it's on a, on a micro scale, then uh, the most simplistic way is ball cratering. Okay, so Anton Parr, we do something called a color test that can measure from about point, uh, 0 0.5 microns up to about 50 microns of coating thickness and also multiple coating as well. So you can, um, so basically, uh, uh, actually, maybe I mean, I can show you that actually while, while you're here. <laughs> I've actually have one already ready in place. So there, that, that system there is a ball cratering system. So you have a, you have a, a defined ball diameter, your sample sits there, mm -hmm. and you uh, create a wear, uh, a, a, a calot as it's called. And, and optically, mm -hmm. you uh, measure that calot or the rings of that calot. And, mm -hmm. um, and then you can actually determine um, from number of uh, points that you have, uh, along that, on the, along those rings uh, or multiple rings, the actual thickness uh, of your coatings, and that could be a single uh, thickness or multiple thicknesses as well. That's the most easiest, uh, cheapest uh, uh, way, especially if you're measuring within the micron range. And that, I said that goes up to about 50 microns in thickness. Yeah. And if you're going to go below that, uh, then you're going to end up having to look at scratch uh, as a, as a means to 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 do that mm -hmm. because then it becomes a little bit more 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 complex because then you've got to also think about the interfacial in 
uh, additional uh, forces between between layers, for example. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, otherwise, there's uh, step methods. So if you can cover part of your sample during coating deposition, you can then do that and then use uh, some type of profilometer. Um, again, th things like the AFM, you can do a step height change if you want to, to do that. Yes. Or um, yeah, depending on the ease, um, you know, if it's if you're doing something, you know, quite simplistic uh, PVD, um, you could do, you could also have some silicon wafer in the chamber, break that wafer and then do, you know, using uh, an SEM to look side on to, to that. And that will give you your, uh, you know, a reasonable approximation of your, uh, of your film thickness. Um, so yeah, multiple ways, but yeah, I'd also recommend the cowl tester. They are, they are quite good. Um, it's, it's yeah, a simplistic, yeah, it's, it's the most simple way of going anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so is there value in looking at nanoscale tribological events when the application is on the micron or millimeter scale, e.g. cutting tool wear? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think I think there could be. It depends. If you've got cutting tools, uh, mm -hmm. it depends on what you're looking to, so where your failure is. What's your, what's your parameters of failure mm -hmm. for a cutting tool? Yeah, there's certain yeah. applications where failures can onset. So if you've got uh, nano pitting, for example, that can lead to micro pitting. Mm -hmm. Um, do you identify those nano pits or nano nano wear uh, at an early stage, um, which could um, propagate to becoming micro and then become a failure? Because if you're looking at cutting tools, you also got the added uh, factor of thermal uh, um, uh, interaction, uh, um, which can uh, affect affect that as well. So. Um, it it just depends, I, you know, um, on where your performance parameters, especially for cutting tools, fit and lie. Um, because, a, as you probably know, that failures don't to, failures can happen at a very small scale and then propagate. Typically, uh, you, you you know you don't only see that in cutting tools, but you see that in uh, uh, engine turbine blades, for example, as well. Um, and even there, you've got turbine blades, but they'll still look at the nanoscale initially to kind of give a, a early stage measure yeah, uh, to counter any long term effects. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's the the thing about well, do you want to look at the fundamentals to see where your initiation points are? I think that's the the main way. It's just remember that sort of nanoscale tribology is very much. Uh, for looking at the, the the fundamentals, fundamentals of interaction, so that's that's kind of where um, its main strength lies. Um, you know, it's you know, as I said throughout the uh, the workshop, um, it's the smaller scale you go, it becomes more complex to uh, to look at. So it's it absolutely depends on on what you're looking at. So got another question here. So for the humidity tribometer, what is its range of humidity? Um, the the range of humidity will be temperature dependent. So um, you know you can get up to about ninety percent humidity uh, at um, say around about um, forty fifty degrees Celsius, um, and that will then basically, or so I should say, ninety eight percent, and then it will progressively. Um, it's just the physics of it. Uh, it will progressively uh, go down as you elevate in temperature. Um, um, you know, um, you know, it's a balance of vapor pressure, um, but it's a function of temperature. Basically, so um, if you're looking to achieve, uh, but obviously in a vacuum environment, you can still maintain a high um, um, humidity at elevated temperature. So if you've got a vacuum environment, you can ex exceed that vapor pressure uh, or, or, or humidity. But there's going to be a balance. There's going to be a, uh, a give and take between two. So if you're expecting 98% humidity at high temperature, then you may be disappointed. <laughs> but that's just the nature of the, the physics of it. Yes. Ah, I think we got another one here real, uh, related to that. So uh, can you specify it in dew point or PPM instead? Um, no temperature dependency? Um, I, I I don't have that data with me. But, I mean, we could do. Uh, I, I'm sure we've, we've got that, but I don't have that on the top of my head. At the moment, but we can share that with you um, if you if you leave your yeah. details in um, in the chat. We can definitely mm -hmm. do that. Yes, uh, please, uh, uh, Pontus. If you have not, um, if you haven't uh, clicked yes to being uh, 
um it's being contacted by uh anton parr please go ahead and so i put initials email in the um in the chat above go ahead and um and email him and he'll be able to get uh back to you okay right i'll uh i'll pass that uh i'll pass that information along thank you very much um oh so we've got uh so while uh, we're doing those uh last few questions there just been releasing the uh handouts we've got one final one on application um papers and studies so we have a couple more questions to do here so we got one uh one from a little earlier which was which kind of wear test is more accurate for lubricants engine oils a ball and disc or four ball test okay so um i think mm. i can go ahead and show or shall i go ahead and well? <laughs> yeah you, 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 uh, we could both share it, but yeah, uh, yeah. Let's yeah. Share your, share your, your thoughts on that. Sure. So I think, um, I think the four ball test, the strength of the four ball test, very much lies in um, more in looking at uh, greases and um, weld forces, and looking at much more extreme environments. Whereas I think you could look at a um, ball and disc, so long as you can achieve the contact pressure of your um of your engine and you know achieve similar you know conditions can you achieve the the um the temperature and you know similar entrainment dynamics of the lubricant i would say ball and disc is far better four ball would be a little bit more for greases or extremes would be my mm. um would be my way in on that mm. yeah so let me just check we haven't got any more so i think one we have one final question here um, so I think this was related to the, uh, tribometer, but any accessories to measure the fluid film thickness during the wear test? Uh, the fluid film thickness. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I'm assuming that means the, 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 more, the, the layering of the film, of uh, the lubricant film on the surface. So. Uh, that's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. Don't, we don't have anything uh, as a module to measure that film thickness. Um, um, you know, I, I mean, if you imagine if you had a film thickness and you're doing a, mm -hmm. a, a physical measurement like this, whether it's in rotation or linear or sliding, um, that film thickness is going to move. It's going to change. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to measure that, um, one means could be uh, if there's any conductivity, potentially, you can put a conductivity probe and see if that changes uh, because of if that layer changes, the conducting path will change, and you can have a, a, a correlation. You could probably do it in a correlated way, but I don't. We don't necessarily have a direct mm -hmm. method to measure that thickness like that. No, It'd be quite challenging. Yeah, it is. That is extremely challenging. I, I guess you could sort of you could look at. Yeah. Um, if you have some sort of uh, clear materials for a contact, you could look at uh, a sort of interferometry method. But again, these are mm -hmm. these are very complex, quite time consuming um, to do. So, yeah, um, and, and I mean, yeah, you could do it optically, but then that that brings its mm -hmm. own challenges altogether, and yeah. you know how, the accuracy of that as well. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Good question, but it's a it's a tricky one. My my guess is it depends on what, if you can if you know the conductivity and if you know that conductivity varies in terms of uh, its uh, thickness and, and uh, path path length, then um, maybe by by conductivity. But that, even that would be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As a, yeah, as, as we've covered many times, tribology is a complex <laughs> subject. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So I uh, I think that's uh, I think that's all for our um, for our questions. We don't have any more in the uh, in the chat. So um, so for everyone, there's um, if you haven't um, clicked to download them already, there are some handouts available on the handouts tab. Um, the Anton Parr website um, link is available there in the uh, the bottom left. Um, yeah. So I think we'll uh, I think with that we'll. Um, We'll conclude the workshop. I just want to say thank you very much, Nishal, for those uh, those fantastic overviews of the equipment. Um, thank thank you. you very much for uh, for going through those questions with me. Um, yes, I hope that was um, I hope that was uh, useful for you all. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. so um, yep, yeah, with that, we'll we'll conclude. All right.
by by initial and thank by you. all that are uh, thank you so. thank you very much <laughs> thank you bye bye everyone keep safe keep well thank you thanks bye